Hello and welcome to Shell Point Today for Tuesday, January 26th. I'm Adam Brown. On today's show, we will get a preview of Adrian Kerr's Academy class on the lost world of Atlantis. And Meg Singer will talk with Terry Kolath about recruiting help for the Island Computer Center. But first, don't forget about tomorrow's Flavors of Matt Lachey outing. Court pickups begin on the island at 7.45 a.m. for this delightful, historical, public art, ecological, and culinary adventure to Matt Lachey. The tour begins at the Leoma Lovegrove Gallery and Gardens, a lunch stop at Matt Lachey Old Fish House Marina for fresh fish from the Gulf, and then top it off with a heavenly morsel of fudge from the CW Fudge Factory across the bridge. The cost of the outing is $24 with lunch on your own, so make sure you're all signed up. And there's always something worth seeing at the monthly Aviation Club meeting. This Thursday, members will gather in the Osprey Room on the island to learn about the hottest topic in aviation right now, and that's drones. Drones are unmanned aircraft that are controlled remotely. Some have cameras on them that take pictures and video. An educator from the Florida Southwestern Collegiate High School and sponsor of their Drone Academy will be the special guest. He and some of his student team members will talk about their involvement with drones and answer questions about current and future applications of these technological wonders. Following the presentation, there will be a live drone demonstration out on the island beach. The meeting begins at 1.15 in the Osprey Room on Thursday. There's still plenty of time to get that suit back from the cleaners or to tackle the shopping malls for that breathtaking dress to wear to the gala this Friday. Imagine is the theme of this year's celebration of the past year's accomplishments here at Shell Point. Hosted by the Legacy Foundation, the event will include special music entertainment from Elizabeth Von Trapp and decadent desserts, compliments of Fine Mark National Bank and Trust. There are two seatings for Friday's gala at the Village Church Auditorium, 2.45 and 6.45 p.m. If you have any questions or for more information, contact the Legacy Foundation at 466-8484. Legend has it that the city of Atlantis was swallowed up by the sea and vanished after a failed attempt to invade Athens, its foreign enemy. Often thought of as the Great Lost World, did this city really exist at one time in history? Well, the good old professor is coming to the rescue to give us an academy class that will investigate the history, the legend, and the recent archaeological discoveries that could shed light on this fascinating mystery. Here's Adrian Kerr as he speaks with Terry Kolath. Hi, I'm Terry Kolath. I'm here with my favorite history professor and yours too, Adrian Kerr. We're talking about a class coming up called The Lost World of Atlantis. Did it exist? Thanks for coming back. Thank you, Terry. It's a pleasure to be back at Shell Point. Well, The Lost World of Atlantis, it occurs to me that I know nothing about Atlantis and you know almost everything there is to know <laughs> about Atlantis. So first, why are we talking about Atlantis? Um, most of us... Uh, in our high school education or beyond, we'll have learned about Plato mm -hmm. and uh, the dialogues that he wrote about, about two learned folk talking about um, history and the position of Athens in the world. Mm -hmm. And it was in that period, um, 500 or so years BC, that uh, the, word, the concept that Athens once upon a time had an enemy in the form of a foreign land um, called Atlantis. And the hint here is Atlantis refers to um, Atlas, and Atlas is a great god, and Atlas gave its name to the Atlantic Ocean. So the people who followed on from these early Greek writings, if they were going to position Atlantis, then most of them for the last four or five hundred years have said, well, somewhere in the middle of, of the Atlantic is where Atlantis was. What was it? Well, um, Plato doesn't give too much of a hint. He just says that um, it gives a dimension, 150 miles by 50 miles. There's a lake in the middle of it. And they had the bad manners to attack Athens and our gods that protected Athens destroyed Atlantis in one day and one night of floods. And then it sank beneath the seas, never to be seen again. And that's all we have. <laughs> so for the last 2,000 years, we have been wondering, did it exist? Yeah. If so, where would it be? And we've spent countless, countless um, hours researching this. Um, there have been people digging everywhere from Spain to the Azores to Greece um, to the Crete 
Minoan civilization and so on. And we've had people doing excavations underground and underwater, people doing sonar readings. Is it in the Black Sea, for instance? There's the latest theory that it's, it was submerged when the Black Sea rose 300 feet. Wow. So it, it never stops to uh, excite us. And of course, nowadays we tend to think of Atlantis. In, in, in the um, Renaissance period, Atlantis was the great lost world, which uh, had everything going for it. It was the place to be, and we've lost so much. And we can't we go back to those wonderful, simple days of Atlantis? Uh -huh. And of course, we have endless movies and TV series, A Man from Atlantis, and so on. And there's endless science fiction books and science fiction cartoons. So it's still alive and well, and in our imagination. And maybe one day, not too far from now, we will have success in pursuing these excavations and actually find some evidence of Atlantis. Until then, we'll have to just base it on the limited information we have from the Greeks and people who've done excavations recently. And you'll share that with us. For a small fee, I will share that secret with you. <laughs> Very good. So join us, please. This is going to be Thursday, January 28th, 4.30 in the afternoon, Grand Cypress Room with Professor Adrian Kerr. And you can sign up right at the door. We hope to see you there. Did you know there's a computer center at the Island Creativity Tunnel, as well as computers over at the Woodlands? It's a great place where you can use a computer as well as get some advice and help from resident volunteers who are fast with the keystrokes. Meg Singer visits with Terry Kolath to talk about the computer centers and to invite other microchip savvy residents to volunteer there. Hello, I'm Terry Kolath. I'm here today with Meg Singer of Teladora, who in addition to other things, is the leadership of the Island Computer Center. Thank you for joining me, Megs. Oh, you're welcome, Terry. It's so fun to be here and talk about one of my passions. It is one of your passions, and we're really, really glad. Have you always been passionate about computers and computer usage? Well, I've always been comfortable with it. You know, uh, I, I got uh, the first computer back in the 80s, and, you know, Dave and I were in publishing, and I got publishers to start using computers when they weren't, you know, uh, so I was always trying to be at the front end. Right now, I'm, a, I'm an only an iOS user. I only have an Apple iPad and an Apple iPhone, and I get along with that. Uh -huh. But I also know how to use Windows. And, and more importantly, you know the value of helping people. I know it, with Terry. It's so great to help, especially people that have just moved here. Uh, and there's yeah. a lot of new people that have moved here. Mm -hmm. And we have a lot of volunteers that are young. And I'm sure people my age and younger that have used computers all their life. And so it's a great way to help others when you have that knowledge. And you manage the resident computer center on the island in the tunnel. And it is, for those who don't know, as you're walking through the tunnel, there's a door in the middle, and you can go in the Pottery Studio, the Technology and Teaching Center, the Photo Studio, the Stamp Room, or your, Woodland, your Island Computer Center. That's right, the Island Computer Center, which is um, around the corner on the way to the Photo Studio. And I think in this interview, my main goal is to share the real, real um, benefit that is to residents who live here. Because yes. as you've said many times, your computer might break, or you may want to try... Or your printer breaks. Or your printer, or you may want lot. to get to your email and you don't want to have a printer or a computer at home. There are any number of reasons why you might want to walk in there. So you kind of have generalists as volunteers, people who can help get you into what you want to do. That's right, that's right. And some people just like to come in and play solitaire sure. to pass the time or to get away from their spouse or... <laughs> <laughs> or to just take a break and enjoy some technology, right, yes. with some nice, like-minded people. Yes, yes. Uh, it's a friendly place. When you come in there, you're offered help, but you aren't, we don't push it on you. But every, all my volunteers, I have about 12 volunteers, and they're all ready to help whoever comes in That's at whatever level they need help. That is so amazing because it's so challenging. We come to technology from so many different um, yes. abilities. And you and I know that technology is changing right while we sit here. I know. And that's one of the great things about being a volunteer there because you kind of can't help but keep abreast of the latest right. changes. Right, right. So we, so we want to make known that the last page of the weekly reminder lists the hours for the Woodlands Computer Center and the Island Computer mm -hmm. Center. And we have a lot of open hours. So we are constantly 
searching out new volunteers who fit in, like the wonderful ones you already have. Yes, but I need more because, well, you know, some of our volunteers are having health issues sure. and are, or will, will soon not be able to help us anymore. Sure, and that's so what I happens really in a retirement community. We exactly. keep moving along. Exactly. Well, what are you looking for in a volunteer, Megs? I'm looking for someone who's comfortable using a computer, mm -hmm. preferably the Windows environment. Um, you really, it would, yeah, if you don't have any experience with Windows, you probably wouldn't be comfortable sure. uh, helping, but most people have, or perhaps they have experience in multiple platforms, but mm -hmm. at least you're comfortable using a computer, you understand what a file is, you understand basically how email works, right. and even though you're not an expert in every different email. And don't so, have to be. Right. right, and I'm looking for people that are willing to give just two hours a week. Fabulous. And it's then, not a lot of time. No, and the value about that same two hours, like Tuesday morning or Wednesday afternoon, is that people come in and know you. They know, well, I, I think I'll go Tuesday. She was so helpful last time. They do. Or, sure. They do that. Now, you and I both appreciate so much the role of a volunteer. What are the benefits of volunteering? Oh, man. Volunteering is the best thing you can do because it really helps you. When you help someone else, you get you can't help but get a benefit. That's right. So um, I guess I would stress the five things um, that you get out of being a resident computer volunteer are, um, number one, you help people stay in touch um, with their family and friends. Um, you get satisfaction out of helping somebody else. Um, Number three, you can even work on your own project there if you want because you aren't being used constantly. And sometimes nobody really needs help that mm -hmm. on a particular day. So I always bring my flash drive with me so that I can work on a project from home. Nice. Maybe, you know, different things. Um, then you get to keep up with the latest technology. We have a Windows 8 and soon to be a Windows 10 computer in there as well as yeah. most of them are Windows 7. Um, and lastly, you get to take computer classes, computer college classes at no charge. Oh, it's an advantage too. It is. Every and one of them are an advantage. And it seems to me that I would think the number one best advantage to volunteering in your island computer center would be just the quality of life you bring to people. That, that, like you said, the it connection. Is. It is. Learning and knowing, doing research, you know, going into the computer center and, mm -hmm. you know, I want to know what kind of flower to put on, on my porch. You know, <laughs> you can just look up anything. I want to see the house I grew up in. What does it look like now? Oh, I know. We anything. Have the world. You run, your volunteers things. bring the world to people. They don't do. They? they do. It's a yeah. great thing. Well, we're so glad. Thank you so much for talking with me today. And for you, if we've piqued your interest and you'd like to either visit the, uh, the Island Computer Center to um, find out anything you want to know about your own personal technology to use the equipment there or if we've interested you in sharing your love of computers and technology as a volunteer. If you are, you can call Meg Singer at Teledora in your resident directory or you can call me and I'll put you in touch with her. And um, once again, I want to thank each of the volunteers who commit to a time schedule in the Island Computer Center. Don't you, Meg? Yes, and we can. We also have substitutes. So if you, if you want to try out, you can be a substitute good at point, first. Good point. So join us. Thanks so much. And now it's time to take a look at today's happenings, Academy News, Menus, and Village Church Connections. Hello, and welcome to the happening segment of Shell Point TV. I'm Caitlin Van Scoy, and I'm here with Bev Chanley, and we're going to let you know all of the activities happening here today at Shell Point. We start at 7.15 with a Health Connections class, Bend, Breathe, and Balance in the Health Club. We move to 8 o'clock for Round Robin Doubles Tennis at the Woodlands Tennis Courts. The Stamp Ministry will be in the Stamp Room at 8.15 down in the Island Tunnel. And Bocce will be played at the Woodlands at 8.30. Also at 8.30, Ladies Golf Association will be meeting at the Shell Point Golf Club. And Open Painting is available in the Art Studio at 9.15. 9.30 is a time for match play mixed doubles tennis at the Woodlands. And 9.45, there's Women's Ministries Bible Study Group in the Village Church. The Suzy Q heads out at 10 o'clock to Woody's Waterfront Restaurant. You do need to sign up for that. And Through the Bible Bible Study Group will be in the Osprey Room at 10.15. At 11.45, there is a Life Quest Living Healthy in the Osprey Room on the island, and that does conclude our morning. Here's Bev to tell you all about our afternoon. 
Thank you, Caitlin. At 12.30, we have Mixed Progressive Bridge in the game room of the Woodlands. And we move to 1.15, where you'll find the Knitters Group in the Osprey Room on the island. At 1.15, the Rollicking Recorderists will be in the Tarpon Room. Shuffleboard will be at the Shuffleboard Courts at 1.15. And also at 1.15, we have Coffee with the Pastors in the Hospitality Room of the Village Church. And the Women's Ministries Prayer Group will be in the Chapel also at 1.15. We have a COPD support group in the Oak Room of the Woodlands at 1.30. And we also have a 1.30 stamp ministry going on in the Sable Room at the Woodlands. The library book talk will be at the Social Center on the island at 2.15. 2.45 is another Health Connections class, Balance and Mobility Advanced. That's in the Health Club and that's currently full. At 4.15 we have Health Connections class, Tai Chi Cha. That's down in the Health Club and that's currently full. At 6.45, we have Movie Night, Witness for the Prosecution, a 1957 film. That's in the Social Center. Well, we're sure happy to see you here today, and we will see you back here again tomorrow. Hi, I'm Terry Kolath with your Academy information for Tuesday, January 26th. At 9.30, writing your memoirs on the computer continues in the Resident Computer Center at the Woodlands. And at 10 o'clock, we visit six Russian cities in the Grand Cypress Room of the Woodlands. And at 10.15, we have iPhone set up in basics, continuing in the manatee room on the island. At 1.15, making word work for you, continues in the technology teaching center on the island. And at 4.30, the alpha course continues in the Grand Cypress room of the Woodlands. I'd like to take a moment to congratulate all Pavilion Auxiliary volunteers who celebrated their 25th anniversary of the auxiliary recently and to share with you that we have many opportunities for you to join them. Please give me a call so I can talk to you about the opportunities, and please look at the last page of the weekly reminder for information about how to sign up for orientation. Menus for Tuesday. In the crystal room, the crystal platter is braised beef with twice baked potatoes and fresh vegetable medley. The dinner special is the turkey buffet for $13.95. The soup of the day is cream of chicken. In the Island Cafe for lunch, the special is a roast beef club with chips for $7.75. The dinner special is oven roasted pork loin with wild rice and steamed broccoli for $8.75. Dinner specials in the Palm Grill are shrimp scampi for $16.95 or fried oyster for $16.95. All menus are available 24 hours a day at www.shellpoint.net. Hi, welcome to Village Church Connections. I'm Andy Hawkins, the senior pastor of the Village Church, and I'm here with John Sapia, who's one of our international workers because we have been in the midst of what we call Global Impact Week here at the Village Church. It's one of the highlights of our church year because we have uh, wonderful guests like you and uh, our friend Charlotte Heisel was here, David Laufer. Uh, so we've had some uh, wonderful opportunities to get acquainted and also to hear the stories from things that are taking place all across the globe. It's a special uh, connection that we have here at the Village Church because we know that we're part of a global community. That's right. It's uh, been a highlight for me, too. That's great. And so, John, tell us a little bit about your background. You've been ministering in Paraguay, mm -hmm. but at the same time, uh, you're, you're not, uh, you know, from there. I'm you're not, not from here. Paraguayan. You're from where? <laughs> I, some days I wish I were a native Paraguayan because <laughs> it would have been easier with the Spanish. Yeah. Um, originally from Brooklyn, New York, uh, born, raised, and trapped there, and uh, <laughs> spent about 18 years before I went to Nyack College. I see. Yeah, fantastic. Well, and uh, I understand uh, from your story that uh, um, you had you went through a, a process with your family that uh, basically you came to the Lord in a kind of remarkable way. Yeah, my parents were believers, um, but I wasn't. And um, I thought that just because my parents were that I was as well. But God doesn't have grandchildren. That's right. uh, he just has children. And uh, I had to make a decision for Christ for myself. Uh, I had made plenty of decisions, and all there were bad. And they ended up putting me in a real bad spot. And But I, when I was about 17, I called out to God and repented. And uh, God saved me for myself, really. Yeah. 
remarkable. And that uh, then eventually uh, you went uh, where to get preparation for uh, ministry, that kind of thing? Well, I didn't go to school to become a missionary. Um, I didn't know that's where God was calling me. Um, but I did go to school to be a minister and to work with teenagers. Uh, I had a strong heart for teenagers. Um, I did meet my wife there, and she was called to be uh, a missionary. Uh, we met at Nyack College in Nyack, New York. And uh, we started dating, and when the Lord finally officially called me to be a youth pastor at first, she almost dumped me. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, she's, yeah. you know, I was dead weight for her, and uh, she was <laughs> going overseas, and since I probably wasn't, uh, but God said he'll work out the timing, and, uh, oh. and he did. He did. Yeah. And so you were a youth pastor for a while, a yeah, good thir- while, actually. 13 years, 13 mostly years. here in Florida. Oh, I see. So you have some connections with Florida then. Yeah. Yeah, so. very good. But eventually uh, then you got the you know, got the same call that your wife did to go overseas, <laughs> right? I did, yeah. yeah. Actually, it's a neat story because um, what happened is uh, my brother, who was a missionary uh, on the other side of the world, um, he was at my church doing the Global Impact Week like I'm doing this week. And he was asking about... Um, uh, he was preaching about Peter getting out of the boat and going to the Lord and meet, leaving the known to move, move to the unknown. Mm-hmm. And I just said, Lord, I'm open. I'm open to whatever you want me to do. And I felt the Lord use these words to call me into missions. It's time. So now the next day I tell Lisa, right? And she's been waiting since 13 years, 15 years after. And she goes, it's about time. You know, she was ready to go. And uh, speaking to my brother and his wife, and uh, she said, interestingly enough, on that night when God said it's time to me, God told her, go tell John and Lisa, it's time. I'm calling them to the mission field. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Now, why Paraguay? Or how did you get to Paraguay? Um, well, my friend was actually uh, going to Paraguay to be a missionary and asked us to pray. And so uh, this is even before um, the situation with my brother and God saying it's time. And um, I started praying and felt the Lord just burning my, in my heart for Paraguay. Mm-hmm. And um, so I wrote to my friend and I said, can I come join you on the team? And he's like, no, we, we don't have spots. And so I figured the Lord shut the door and that was that. Well, then six, eight months later, God speaks to me through my brother. I call up the Christian Missionary Alliance. I tell them I, I, I'd like to talk to you about going overseas. And I share with them my story. And the representative from the alliance says, yeah, you're called. Now we got to figure out where you're going to go. What do you know about Paraguay? And I'm like, are you kidding? And so from then on, it was just all the way. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah. So you've been in Paraguay for how long? Eight years. Eight years. Tell us a little bit about the ministry that you've had in Paraguay. So. Yeah, I have two main ministries. One is um, the lead pastor of a new church plant uh, where we are um, trying all the time uh, to develop, uh, to reach people for Christ and then disciple them and develop them in Christ. Um, part of the reaching people for Christ is a lot of evangelism efforts. And um, we go under this headline. If our church ceased to exist in our neighborhood, would our neighbors know? Mm-hmm. And so we, uh, with that question, we go into the neighborhood in order to help our presence be felt. And so we're always caring for people and doing cleanup so that people will say, there's something happened in that church. And they do. And they come and they visit and they come to Christ that way. Yeah, sort of sort of uh, physical manifestations of, uh, of their heart for ministry. A- absolutely. You, you can't share the words of Christ unless you share the love of Christ. Yeah. And so that's what we do. Uh, the other um, main area of my ministry is we have 11 men who have accepted the call into full-time ministry, and I have the privilege of mentoring them and coaching them, and that's just the, the greatest thing. Absolutely, and my understanding of, of, of many of the, of the uh, countries in Latin America uh, who have just really gotten established with churches uh, really have a dearth of leadership uh, at the pastoral level, and that's one of the main things that our international workers can help uh, develop. That's correct. In fact, right now, uh, we have one Paraguayan pastor 
who is leading three different churches. Yeah. Uh, so we come in and uh, we we try not to be the leaders of the churches. We try to help train Paraguayan pastors to be mm -hmm. the leaders of Paraguayan churches. Yeah. And that's always been uh, really one of the, the philosophical, uh, I think, uh, uh, benchmarks of the Christian and Missionary Alliance. When right. we've gone overseas, uh, right. we've wanted to plant indigenous churches. We don't want them to necessarily look like Western churches or American churches. We've really wanted uh, them to take the lead. That's right. It's my favorite part about being in the Christian Missionary Alliance. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Yep. Well, it's been a delight to have you with us this week, John. Thank we you. certainly uh, will continue to pray for you and Lisa and uh, know that the Lord will guide and direct you wherever He uh, has for you. But uh, it's been a pleasure. Uh, you've contributed a great deal to all of us uh, during this week. Well, I've enjoyed it, that's for sure. That's great. Yeah. Well, we thank you for joining us on Village Church Connections, and we hope to see you very soon. And that will just about do it for today's program. Be sure to join us again tomorrow when Anna Smith of Finemark Bank will talk about mobile check deposits. And Don Bourne will give us the latest rundown of the concert series. Until then, I'm Adam Brown, and this has been Shell Point Today for Tuesday, January 26th. Thanks for spending time with us today, and we'll see you back here tomorrow. Bye.